Okay, let's get started. Today's study tip says, use colored pens to write different physiological pathways. For example, write down the steps of glycolysis in blue, citric acid cycle in red, and the electron transport system in green. So some of you already do this. I've seen you. You have like four pens on your desk at all times. You write the notes in different colors and you make little pictures in different colors. I happen to be a big color fan. For me, um, using highlighters was good. I also love flashcards, so I would actually highlight the corners of each of set of cards for each chapter, like chapter one was yellow, chapter two is blue, and then I would um, remember color as well as what was on the flashcard. So I think I mentioned this before using the flashcards. This is always the color though helps your brain to make an association. So chapter one, I know this, that was when I chose the color yellow, so let me, it helps to organize in your brain. And maybe it doesn't, maybe you're not a color person, that doesn't really help you. But for me, loved it. I love those pens that have like six different colors, eight different colors on them. Those were good for me. Uh, when the gel pens became real popular at Costco, you could buy like a hundred gel pens and I have every color. I remember pathways in different colors. So if you haven't tried this study tip, think about it. Maybe it'll work for you. Chapter six. Cellular environment, sorry, cellular interactions with the environment. So, this is a preparation for the big chapter on neurophysiology, chapter seven. And this, um, it would be helpful if you read the chapter before listening to this lecture. So, this is one of the toughest lectures, okay? Membrane transport, this part luckily is easy because we had this during lab. So, membranes, remember, are selective, they are permeable, which means anything can pass. Semi-permeable, which means semi is half, right? Some stuff can, some stuff can't. And they're impermeable. Some are not going to allow anything to cross. All substances move across the membrane by either passive or active transport. This is a passive transport picture. It has three things. We're going to talk about um, the each one of these separately. Each one of them has no energy requirement. So no ATP is needed. Second is everything moves from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And there are three types, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. So this top one is showing um, little molecules that are nonpolar. They can just slip through the membrane through diffusion. Fusion. Some, like these, a little bigger, need a channel also diffusion. And this one is showing probably glucose being transported with a carrier just like you did in lab. Osmosis is not shown in this picture so we'll go through it separately. Okay, so back to fusion. Lipid soluble or hydrophobic molecules pass freely across the cell membrane. That's because the phospholipid tails are also hydrophobic, so they allow hydrophobic things to pass through. So let me give you an example. One would be um, like estrogen or testosterone. Steroid hormones like that, they don't need to be um, going through a channel to get across because the tails will let them pass because they too are hydrophobic. Other small substances pass through protein channels that can be open or close. And water passes through channels called aquaporins. Things like oxygen just go across. Gases just pass freely. This is the second one, osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of low solutes to high solutes. So if you look at this picture, on the left side, concentration is lower. On the right side, the concentration of solutes is higher and the water is going to move from left to right. Now, I told you that it follows the rules of passive diffusion with high to low concentration, right? And you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't follow the rules. But really, the water is going from an area with lots of water on the left to the area of very little water on the right. 
So we never say water is going from an area of high concentration of water to low concentration of water. We talk about the solute concentration instead. So osmosis is following the rule for water going high to low. But really when we talk about where is the water going, we say from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. Okay, so the area that's more dilute has more water and it wants to go to the right. So about osmosis, it's, it's the movement of water across the membrane from low solute to high solute concentration is where the water will go. If solutions are in a sealed container, and this is the experiment you'll do in lab, the side of the membrane with the highest solute concentration will have a positive osmotic pressure. So I think I have a picture of this. So in this, this is a closed system. So it says high osmotic pressure will be found on the right side of this closed system. So pretend we have a, a lid on this box. And actually in the experiment they put like a little meter on the top, right, to measure mmHg, which is pressure. So they have a little meter here on the top of the left side, a little meter on top of the right side. This left side has just pure water. The right side has glucose. So which way will the water want to go? To the left or to the right? To the right. Mm -hmm. When the water wants to move to the right and there's a closed top, it can't really move to the right. There's no space for it to go. Now the glucose can't leave, right? So the pushing of this pressure of the water wanting to come over to the right actually will make a positive number on the reading on top of this right side of the chart. Okay, so if we asked you which side has the higher osmotic pressure, the left side or the right side, you'll say the right side because it has uh, more solutes and more water wanting to go that way even though it can't get through. So it is a pressure, it's a real force and you can measure it with the machine. This is facilitated diffusion. Again, following the rules of high to low, this is glucose. Which way will the glucose want to go? Out of the cell or into the cell? Which way will it go? It will want to go from high to low, so it will want to come from uh, the outside to the inside. Now for it to get across, because it's too big, and not only is it big, remember the molecular weight in our experiment is 180. It's also hydro Philic. It likes water, so it definitely cannot get through the membrane. So there is a protein in the membrane that has a perfect fit, the lock and key model that we were talking about with enzymes. So this comes in, it matches like Pac-Man, and it opens up on the other side, and then it drops off um, the glucose into the inside. So it's high to low, but it requires a carrier protein. No ATP needed to do this though. Okay? So it's the binding of the glucose to the protein causes a change in the shape which then makes it want to come out on the other side and once it leaves it wants to go back to its original position. Okay, so about facilitated diffusion. This is for large molecule, molecules. Solutes bind to a protein transporter. The transporter has a maximum speed to move the molecules. This is important when we talk about urinary system. We'll talk about glucose transporters in your kidneys and how they have a maximum speed. Some pharmaceuticals are designed to inhibit transporters. So sometimes there, someone has a disorder where the transporters are overworked or not doing their job or whatever and they might want to actually target that. So they design a pharmaceutical that might go and actually bind to that spot and prevent the transporters in order to make someone better. Of course this could be dangerous too, right? You could make something worse. Cystic fibrosis is one of the stories. It is a genetic defect of the chloride ion transporters. Have you ever heard of this before? So these people um, produce too much, or transport, sorry, too much chloride ions. Too many of them. The chloride, who's the best friend of chloride? CL. CL minus, who does it always go with? What other ion goes with it? Na, right? So Na and Cl, Na plus, Cl minus, all this goes, and salt attracts water. 
So we will learn this in another chapter. I'll introduce it now. Where there is salt, water follows. Okay, so if they are excreting salt, say on the palm of their hands, CL, NA, then water will go with it and they'll have, um, you know, kind of uh, wet, sticky hands, right? You know, like sweaty hands. That's not a problem, sweaty hands, but it is a problem, say, in their lungs, where they secrete NA and CL, water follows, they end up getting mucus in their lungs, and then you can't get good diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the lungs because they're full of fluid. So um, I have a, a friend of a friend, there you go, who has cystic fibrosis. She's young, she's like 24, and she recently had a lung transplant because all the medications, everything, there's just no cure for cystic fibrosis yet. And so she had such problems with her lungs, she was on steroids to prevent inflammation, all these things, and it didn't really work, so she finally got a lung transplant. And imagine, she was on the list for a lung transplant for like three and a half years. This is uh, what happens when you, um, say, uh, eat lunch, and you need more glucose transporters because you have more you have food so you need to transport right this is what happens the glucose transporters in the top picture are held together in vesicles inside of your cells so here's the carrier proteins little pac-man right when there is a signal and the signal happens to come from insulin because high glucose releases insulin from the pancreas remember the vesicles will then be stimulated to come over to the plasma membrane and fuse. So there's fusion, so they get inserted into the plasma membrane and now they can start bringing more glucose in. And of course, once the insulin starts to go down and you've digested your food, it does just the opposite. It brings these glucose carriers back into the cell. Alright, so the opposite of passive transport is active transport. So active transport is just the opposite. It doesn't go high to low, it goes low to high and it requires ATP. So in this picture we're seeing on the top low calcium on the left side inside of the cell, high calcium on the outside or extracellular fluid. Here's some carrier proteins. In this case it's going to move the calcium from low to high. So in order to do that, in the second part of the picture you'll see what's required to do that. ATP. Right, so ATP is required to move this pump so we learn about sodium potassium pump when we did the experiment in lab. This is a calcium pump and we need this um, specifically in our muscles. We'll talk about this another time. Calcium is moved from the inside to the outside in this case from low to high concentration and ATP is needed. Okay, so the rules of active transport. It uses a protein in the membrane to move solutes. We often call it a pump. It always requires ATP. There are two types of active transport. One is called primary active transport, which needs ATP directly. And the second is called secondary transport, which needs ATP indirectly. And there's a low to high concentration in this case. So we say against the concentration gradient. We say calcium, in that picture before, calcium is being moved against its concentration gradient. Let me talk a little bit about sodium potassium pump, but I think you already know it. Sodium potassium pump moves three potassiums out of the cell, two potassiums in, and requires one ATP. So this we did in lab, I think you got it. Let me show you um, a little bit more about that primary versus secondary active transport. This picture is not in your book anymore, and I kind of liked it because it's important for the renal system to review this. So pretend we have this uh, sodium ion ball, and we want to push it up this hill from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. If you want to push it, you'd actually use your muscles, right? You push a ball up the hill. That is active transport. It took ATP in order to pump that sodium up the hill. It went from an area of low concentration, right, to at the bottom of the hill, to an area of high concentration at the top of the hill. Once you get to the top of the hill, and it's going to move passively from high to low concentration, right? Oops, sorry. Well, Oh my. Oh my. There we go. Let's try again. Once the sodium 
comes off the top here. It's falling, meaning it's going from high concentration to low concentration, and that's passive, right? But look at this transporter here. This is a glucose molecule that wants to go from low concentration to high concentration, and it's like a, you know this board going here, teeter-totter, as the energy of the sodium falling helps to give energy to the glucose going up in the air. But it looks like no energy is actually needed to do this, no ATP directly, right? Nobody's pushing any of these balls. But someone did have to push the sodium up this side in order to make this cool teeter-totter work. So this is called secondary active transport. The glucose being moved from low concentration to high concentration is called secondary. It goes along with something being moved passively. Usually it's sodium and glucose going opposite of each other. And the ATP wasn't really needed until this first part over here on the left. So we call this primary active transport, we call this passive transport, and we call the glucose moving secondary active transport. So don't stress too much about this now. Try to get a little snapshot of it. But when we get to the um, kidneys, we're going to talk about it more, so you'll need to refresh then. Okay, here's a picture of what we were just talking about. This blue transporter in the membrane is going to move sodium from an area of high sodium which is outside of the cell to an area of low sodium which is inside and at the same time it's going to bring glucose into the cell but the glucose is high on the inside so technically the glucose does not want to come in right because that would be low to high but since this transporter holds a spot for it it and the sodium does want to come in the two are going to bind then the protein transporter changes shape and the glucose is coming in with the sodium and the sodium has gone um, from high concentration to low but the glucose moves up its concentration gradient and or against its concentration gradient we say and comes inside okay so this is something we're going to look at in the kidney this uh, co-transporting of sodium and glucose so we say here the passive movement of sodium allows for the active movement of glucose, no direct ATP needed. Next term, bulk transport. So we move lots of things quickly in and out of a cell with endocytosis, remember that word, endo means inside, exo, outside, pino, you know Pino? Pino means to drink, so that would be bringing fluid in, and phago, eat, phagocytosis, so bringing uh, not just fluids, but maybe bacteria, viruses, other things. Endocytosis, so the membrane makes like a little pouch, a purse, kind of like a drawstring purse, and then here you have a vesicle being made to bringing things in, okay? Exocytosis, just the opposite. A vesicle comes up, fuses with the plasma membrane, releases its products. Okay, so exo, endo, pino, and phago. Here is your group question. It says, describe the movement of water and glucose and the height changes on either side of the membrane. So this first one has water with the blue dots, glucose with the uh, diamond, green diamonds, a membrane, no lids. Okay, and this pretend the membrane is permeable to water only, and this one pretend that the membrane is permeable to glucose only. So give this a try. Think about what, which way will they go, and what will happen to the heights in the membrane, or to the heights of the solution on either side of the membrane. Okay, pause the show. Show. Pause the lecture. Take a minute and try it. Okay, the first one, water will move which way? To the right or to the left? To the right. Glucose will move? Can't move, right? We said this membrane is permeable to water only. So the water will come over, the glucose will stay, and what will happen to the height of the water on the left? It will go down, mm -hmm. and the right side will go up. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, if there were lids on them, it would show um, 
it wouldn't be able to move, right? So we'd see zero pressure on the left, and on the right we would see some positive pressure. So that water wants to push to the right side. This one here is a little different because the membrane is permeable to glucose only. And as you know from the experiment lab, that's not possible, right? If you make an MWCO membrane of 200, the water and the glucose will go. So this is kind of a special story that you couldn't see in real life. It's okay, I can make it up, right? Glucose would go then which way? To the uh, right or to the left? To the, to the left. Water goes... Well, it doesn't, right? In this case, the water doesn't go. Now, what do you think would happen to the height of the um, water or solutions on either side if some of these glucose came over? Do you think it would change the height? Probably not, because without water, water is most solutes or most solutions are mostly water, right? There are some sugars, of course, dissolved in it, but not very many compared to the number of water molecules. So the movement of some glucose is not really going to change the height of the membrane. And it will um, make, if we put a lid on it though, it would probably change the osmotic pressure, right? Because the glucose was, would come to equilibrium and then the, the two would be the same, so it's a zero and zero on each side. But as far as the, the height of the uh, solutions on the either side of this membrane, it's not really going to change. Okay, that's osmosis. All right, now we get to some good stuff. Neurophysiology. You can get a whole PhD in this thing, right? All the really smart kids did that. Uh, neurophysiology requires a re us to review the basics of electricity. So, like charges repel and opposite charges attract, right? So there is, like, you know, like when you get, um, my kids love this. Kids and grown-ups love this. They love playing with magnets. So, you know, if you get um, some magnets and you try to put the two sides together that, you know, are the opposite, a plus and a minus side, you know, they snap together, right? And then they, you pull it apart and you're like, wow, it's so strong. So it snaps together again. And if you turn it over... You try to put, you know, the plus and the plus together. You know how, like, you can't, you push with all you all your might, right? And it, then it slips past, right? So it won't go together because the opposite charges, um, or sorry, similar charges repel. So when you put the plus and the minus together really close and you don't let them snap together, you can kind of feel the energy between them, right? So there, we call this potential energy. When these charges are separated, we have a potential to do work, a potential energy. And this energy is measured as voltage. Now, we don't usually measure the voltage between two magnets, but you would, say, in the plug in the wall, right? So you can go to Home Depot, get a voltmeter. It's usually a yellow kind of box for, you know, 25 bucks. It's got uh, one end that has a cord that's red, another is black. You stick it in to um, the outlet and it will read a number for you and tell you the voltage of that outlet. And do you know what the voltage is when you plug in your um, phone or something into the wall? It's 110 volts. Now remember you don't stick your fingers in it, right? You don't stick pennies in it because it's a, it's a disconnect, disconnected voltage that has um, you know, once you connect the loop by plugging something in, then you get energy into your hair dryer or whatever. In the cell, there's the same thing. Oh, by the way, so that's 110, let me think. In Europe, they use a bigger one, like 220, so if you put your hair dryer into, you know, a plug in Europe, you'll blow the fuse, okay? If you put, you know, a straightener, curling, straight, a curling iron or a hair straightener, it'll melt, so they have a lot more energy in their houses there. And um, the little batteries that are, you know, square batteries that you might need in your house, in your alarm clock or something, those square batteries are 9 volts. So 110, 9 in a cell, it's really small. It's milli. Milli means 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 3. So it's really small. Where do we get the charges in the cell? From cations. 
Remember these are positive charges, potassium and plus uh, potassium plus anions that have negative charges like Cl minus or proteins because the end of a protein is a COO minus. So let me write that down for you. So if you have a protein, where's my pen here? One end of the protein has an NH2, so uh, H N and another H coming off NH2, and the other side is COO minus. So the NH2 could be sometimes positively charged and the COO minus negatively charged. So this is actually, proteins are a reason for why we have some negative charges in our cells. The big players in this story are sodium and potassium, so we'll talk about those more. Okay, this should be blank on your handout, right? So we want to fill this in. We're going to look at the intracellular concentration of an ion. And remember, concentration is, is millimolar. The extracellular concentration and the relative permeability of the membrane. So let's do um, potassium first. So potassium on the inside of the cell is 150 millimolar. On the outside of the cell, it's 5. So where is the concentration the highest, inside or outside? Inside. Sorry, I have to take drinks along the way. Uh, relative permeability of the membrane means like, like a percentage. So it's like 50 to 75 percent permeable. So that means that potassium can get across the membrane. It's um, pretty small and it can pass. Sodium on the inside is 12, on the outside is 145. Permeability, 1. That means it can't cross the membrane. Okay, It has to have a channel to get across. The potassium can usually slip through much better than a sodium can. And that has to do with the size of the molecules and how it works. Chemistry. Cl always goes with who? We were just talking about this with the cystic fibrosis story. It always goes with Na. Okay, so we find very little Cl minus on the inside. The number is 9 millimolar. Outside, 125, and the permeability, 0. So they kind of go together. And what I do usually when, I, when I'm thinking about this is I think about a cell, and I'll, I'll draw a cell. It's going to be, where's my pen now? What do I have here? I'm going to draw a circle. Not all cells, of course, are circles, right? And it's got a high um, potassium on the outside, so I usually draw like, I mean, on the inside, sorry. I usually draw a big K on the inside, little K on the outside to kind of remind me of the concentrations and to think about where these ions want to go and where they will go, okay? So high sodium outside. I'm not going to draw Cl- minus because, as I said, it's not a big player here. But if you measure the inside versus the outside of a cell, you're going to see um, a voltage across them. So the experiment that they do um, is with um, frog eggs. And let me show you that in just a second. Experiment with frog eggs. If you take a frog, and I, I didn't study neurophysiology, so I didn't have to do this, but lots of my friends did, and they have to keep frogs in the laboratory and female frogs and when they lay their eggs they get them, take them, and they poke them with really tiny my under a microscope microscopic voltmeters. So not like the big ones you have at um, Home Depot. But the machines are very similar in how they work. And when they poke the inside and compare it to the outside, they see a number in the top right corner. Do you see the number? It says minus seventy millivolts. So they thought it would just be zero, right? Why would there be a charge across the membrane? But it turns out that they discovered that it is. And they, by the way, why do they use eggs? Why ova? What is the biggest cell of the body? Right? That's it, the ova. So if you've got to work with the cell, you want to work with the big one so you can see it the best. Um, there are, um, there is a reason for why this is minus 70. We're going to discuss it. This is called the resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. Sodium, they draw it like I did, right? Big on the outside, small on the inside. Potassium, big on the inside, small on the outside. Okay? 
So we're going to talk about why this is actually negative, right? The inside is negative, minus 70, compared to the outside. So why is the inside more negative than the outside? Fun fact, is it true that a person can die from drinking too much water? The answer is yes. Did you know that? You probably did. The high amounts of water will lower the cellular concentrations of the sodium and potassium ions of the neurons, causing a loss of membrane potential. Neurons will no longer be functional. It's true. So those numbers, 145, 150, those concentrations have to be like that. And as you know, if you make something more dilute, then they're not going to be as concentrated, and you're not going to get sodium and potassium working correctly. Okay, so the reasons for negative resting membrane potential. So first of all, we're going to talk about the chemical gradient. So that means the high to low thing. Okay, so let me draw over here in the corner. Let me find my pointer again. Big NA where? Outside. Little NA inside. Big K and little K. And the inside is negative, right? We'll put some negative signs. Okay, so first chemical gradient. This is the question like where or which way do these chemicals or these ions want to go based on their high to low, okay, based on high to low concentration. Which way do they want to go? So let's do, what do I have here first? Potassium, okay? Potassium wants to go which way? In or out based on the concentration gradient? Wants to go out, right? And when it goes out, positive charges leave. And when positive charges leave, the inside becomes negative, right? When pluses leave, the inside becomes negative. So it says potassium wants to move to the extracellular fluid from high to low concentration. Oh yeah, here's the question. Is it allowed to leave? Do you remember the permeability of potassium? It was like 50 to 75, right? So yes, it is allowed to leave and negative charges are left inside. Okay, so this is one reason why the inside is close to, gets close to minus 70. Second, sodium. Sodium wants to go which way? Looking at the picture, it wants to go from high to low. It wants to go inside. Can it go inside? What was the permeability? It was like 1, so no, it cannot. So that means that positive sodium has to stay outside. And if positive potassium leaves and we don't have something come in to counteract it, the inside is going to stay negative. Okay, So sodium wants to move to the intracellular fluid from high to low concentration, but it's not allowed to enter, so few positive charges enter the cell. Okay, So we have positives leave, but no positives come to counteract it. Alright, try it again. Uh, electrical gradients. Okay, so this time we're going to do the same picture, but we're going to think about where they want to go based on their electrical part. Okay, so we have this potassium K plus here and Na plus outside. Now electrically, K plus doesn't want to go out or stay in because positive charges are attracted to negative, right? So it wants to stay in. Sodium, what will it do? Does it want to go out or in? it wants to come in, right? But can it get in? No, we said that, so it's going to stay out. So let's write this down. Potassium wants to stay in, right? Positive charges want to stay with the negatives. This is not helping me, though, explain the negative 70, okay? It, it is true that this happens, but the other reasons for it really make it minus 70, okay? So positive charges stay, but it's not really helping to explain why it's minus 70. In fact, it makes it more positive. But the chemical gradient is the winner in this story. Sodium wants to go to the intracellular fluid also. Sodium wants to come in. As we said, it's not allowed. And so a few positive charges enter. So you don't have a lot of pluses coming in, but you ha still have the negative charge inside. Okay, are you holding on? Tough lecture, I told you. And the sodium-potassium pump. 3 Na's out, 2 potassiums in, so it's not balanced, right? So if 3 positives leave and 3 positives came in, it would, it would remain neutral, but it's not. 3 positives out, only 2 positives coming in, 
So your net result is the inside is more negative or positive? Inside is more negative, right? So if you have uh, positive charges coming out, one, two, three coming out, only two coming in, it helps to make the inside more negative. And remember the pump requires uh, one ATP, right? Three, two, one. Here's a picture again of the sodium potassium pump. You got it though. Anything else I want to say there? There's no ATP in this pump. Let's put that on there. One, one. ATP. And there's a, a pump right here. Okay? Types of cell signaling. Now, the neurons send electrical signals by changing that resting membrane potential to minus 70. And we're going to talk about this next time. It's called an action potential. So the minus 70 is actually important, and it changes. It goes from minus 70 to minus 55 to 30 to, to 0. It goes up and down, down to negative 90. We'll talk about this. You can read it. You're going to have to read about it before, probably. Um, the action potential is a way to send signals. There are other ways to send signals in cells. One is called the gap junction. This is a direct communication with um, membrane proteins. So here's a picture of one cell on the top, one cell on the bottom, and these, um, I'll change my pointer here so I have the arrow again. The purple proteins on the top cell connect to the bottom ones so that there's a space between them and things can um, travel through like sodium or potassium or hormones. So these proteins are called um, connexin proteins. They make gap junctions. So two cells are connected. Sometimes there's a cell like this cell in part A at the top that makes a chemical or a hormone that goes directly to its uh, neighbor. So that para means next to. So this is called paracrine action. There might be an axon from a neuron that uh, at the end, the axon terminal, has neurotransmitters released. This is called a synapse. And then there might be this one, which is a gland, an endocrine gland. Makes a hormone that has to travel a long distance to get to its target. So these are all different types of chemical signal signaling. And um, we're going to talk about synapses next time. And then after the first exam, we're going to talk about hormones in the endocrine system more. Okay, so writing this down now. Paracrine action are chemicals or hormones sent to um, its neighbor. Synapses are neurons communicating with its target cell and it requires going a long distance. Um, endocrine action is um, hormone from the gland traveling to another long distance through the blood. So the difference is this goes through the blood to an organ. Synapses are super fast as you probably know. Endocrine take a long time because to get from say your you know uh, heart to your foot right takes a whole minute for the traveling of blood to get through your body so you can imagine hormones are going to take a long time to get their action going. Okay? Whew, you're done. <laughs>